So they were running um, often on government funding, which, for example, in the United States was a problem after the NEA funds dried up. And it's, uh, I mean, we heard, uh, experienced something like that firsthand last year when we were doing a show at, in, in the Netherlands at a space called Strom Den Haag, which is a 20-year-old institution, which is not exactly an artist-run space, but it's uh, uh, like a hybrid of something like that. And it was very funny. It, um, when we went there to do a site visit, um, the, the people that, run, that were running the institution were very proudly telling us, you know, the Netherlands has fantastic funding for the arts. Look, on every square we have a sculptor. Everything is great here. We have tons of money. Um, you and behold, uh, within six months, the, the entire uh, arts funding system in the Netherlands collapsed. And they lost 70% uh, of, uh, of their funding. And it was quite funny because the project that we were presenting there was um, time back, which was an alternative economy, which uh, instead of uh, running just for the duration of an exhibition, ended up being something that they, kept, they have kept for almost a year and a half now, because it became um, not just a showpiece, but actually a means for them to try to keep their institution running. So, they, I mean, like, uh, then of course what you see is that what happens is that there is a lot of private funding that slips in to, uh, uh, towards institutions, uh, I'm sorry, to, uh, towards artificial spaces, like, I don't know, for example, um, artist space in New York, is that, no, art in general, I'm sorry, um, which is a, a space that was supposed to be run by a board of um, uh, artists and so on, and Something has happened there uh, in the last 20 years, with, um, so the space now does not have a board of uh, artists, but a board of trustees, which are people that have uh, no direct relationship with art as producers, but as art lovers or people that want to hang out with artists. So it's, which I mean, like, it's very, uh, uh, it's interesting and it's nice, but it's also problematic if that is, uh, the, the relation, the power uh, structure that you have to get uh, things done. I think there's an interest. I mean, depending, I guess, on where one like looks for, like, like with this terminology of an artist and space is perhaps received differently in Cairo or in Alexandria. So in Egypt, essentially, you have many spaces that I would say are run by artists, like, um, but they don't necessarily fit within the sort of discourse of how we talk about artist-run spaces. And essentially, these spaces that are um, founded and run by artists actually um, step in place of um, the extremely absent, uh, otherwise sort of state, private, or public institu art institutional structures. So um, you have uh, um, independent schools of art for young artists by artists, or you have exhibition spaces, like or like uh, like project spaces and so on. But essentially, they're trying very much to take on the role and the characteristics of um, larger institutions elsewhere. And I think this is also where, like in this, in a sense, we also fit in as a, as one of those particular initiatives. But in relation to your question about the future, I think what becomes interesting is that these spaces, although they're more like precarious and they run on lower budgets and they don't have the sustainability and support of the state or otherwise, um, they also um, they're. Or the, or the characteristics of the risks they face are quite different because also they um, they're much more memorable and they can much more easily adapt like to the sort of economic and sort of and political circumstances um, around them. So in the case, so you can change your programming, you can easily change like how you work and so on and so forth. And I think there's a certain potentiality in this flexibility that is really interesting. And I think um, like I would. Yeah, I, I sort of I have more trust towards these, sort of these more organic, smaller institutions that are um, that are growing like over like this sort of like prevalent state of let's say crisis that's being spoken about in relation to um, you know like large scale museums that are suffering from cuts. But this does not mean to say that these larger structures or entities shouldn't exist. But I think the question perhaps could be is that, okay, how do these smaller um, artist-run spaces or spaces run by artists inform how these then larger institutions that are suffering, um, yeah, how do you find a dialogue 
to actually support, let's say, these structures or become more interdependent. Okay. Perhaps speak a little bit about that. Um, I mean, one of the main issues in Italy is that we never had like a proper tradition of artist-run spaces. Although now there's a lot from south to north, um, meaning over the last five years a lot of artists came up with the idea of uh, opening up their own space in order to be able to um, develop a discourse without depending from uh, major institutions. And uh, funnily enough, it's, 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 a, it's a trend which is growing and growing. Even Artissima last year put together Artissima Lido, which is also present this year, even though with international artist and spaces where last year's Artissima Lido was a constellation of projects uh, 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 of presentation of Italian independent spaces really from all the possible regions and I think all of them are struggling pretty much with the funding so which is uh, uh, I think the problem when we come up with a definition of what independence means so um, for instance yesterday I was part of a panel here in Artissima organized by one of the very major uh, bank foundations in Italy, and they launched an open call last year uh, to uh, found um, artist and spaces actually, and residency programs. And uh, they selected 14 projects which went really well, but now the issue is that nobody knows if these uh, 14 institu small institutions or independent art spaces will be able to continue because they completely depend on this uh, uh, foundation, on this bank foundation to, to move on with uh, other projects, other residences for artists and so on. So I think um, speaking about Italy, it's pretty much a definition of independence which, which lacks. I mean, everybody is struggling also with uh, what does independence mean. Whereas in Austria, I'm, I'm, I'm now exploring the, uh, the country from the perspective of Graz, I mean, there are some amazing independent art spaces, but even if they define themselves as independent, they rely on public funds. And obviously, they do, um, um, they do act and they do work in a completely different way than the major museums and, and the Kunstverein and the Kunsthalle, but nevertheless, the funds come from the very same source. So obviously, it's once again, what does it mean being independent? I mean, uh, this is something that uh, with Anton we have talked a lot about. No? Um, it's uh, an ongoing conversation which uh, starts from Anton bringing up this, uh, the fact that um, two of the main artists of the 20th century, being uh, Mondrian and Rochenko, uh, actually died in pretty much abject poverty, both of them. One of them in the, in the uh, Eastern Bloc, in the Socialist world, and the other one in the Western Bloc. So, um, of course, this is not something that has to do with uh, only with economical systems and the failure of, ca uh, of capitalism, but with the condition of being an artist, right? And the kind of uh, way in which you put your work at the mercy of other people because you're not supposed to be dealing with money because it's kind of like a dirty thing to, to involve yourself in good, fin good finances somehow. So there are a million of uh, middlemen and financing instructors that end up handling um, somebody's work or state and um, which is why uh, artists, I mean, it, th that uh, Mondrian died in poverty, for me it's kind of like absurd, it's something that I have a very hard time um, processing somehow. So, um, the, um, how, I mean, it, I guess like, the problem is uh, what uh, we were saying, like what is independence and what is self-sufficiency and what is a matter of autonomy and how can you structure not only an artist on the space but an artistic life and an artistic practice um, that is not entirely dependent of handouts, wherever they may be coming from. So that's, I mean, I think that's, uh, I mean, it's very funny because something quite peculiar, just, uh, um, I'm going to interject a very recent personal story here. Um, uh, which is that um, the, we, uh, they, they put out um, a list every year, which is the uh, Power 100 list, which lists who are the most powerful people in the art world somehow. And for a reason, Anton and myself and Nick Lutz ended up in ranking quite high. I guess they're number seven or eight or something like that. Um, meanwhile, um, I'm like, okay, so I guess I'm powerful somehow. Um, I don't see any evidence about it, but okay, I guess I'm powerful. Uh, meanwhile, I'm supposed to be having a show at a privately run foundation in Rome, which gets uh, cancelled because the collector guy that runs the foundation wanted to get a work of mine for free, and I refused to give it, and then he basically cancelled my show. So 
where does my power, uh, what does it help me for, right? So that's the that's the kind of uh, I mean, like I if in, and if that happens to me, I don't know. I mean, like. I can imagine, yeah, there is uh, something to be done there. That's clearly an issue, but I, I just wanted to uh, make a point uh, here, like to somehow like uh, give a little bit of structure to our talk. Uh, it's clear that uh, when one thinks about artist-run uh, spaces, one always comes up with the question of funding, but uh, I would also like to address the question of content, because I mean, I, I would say that uh, you know, like art and politics are contingent notion, and uh, you know, like the art world that we inhabit, like the art that we think of as like contemporary art, is roughly 200 years old, and uh, it's uh, something that uh, has to do with a claim, uh, a claim on the political and a claim on the public. So, I mean, that's why we never had uh, art as the you know, like the type of art that we have today uh, in other places or in other times of history. And so there's like something uh, that is fundamentally democratic about uh, modern art. And the question is, uh, and I would like to go back to one, what Anton said, you know, in the 60s, precisely when this uh, art that starts up as like a fundamentally democratic claim on the public becomes an instrumental of like, uh, or becomes capitalized or monetized by like capitalist structures, then you know like you have like this uh, a plethora of artist run spaces that somehow uh, reclaim the public. But you know like they do it with also like, uh, uh, or also claiming a different type of content, which is also like a question that I would uh, I'd like to address the panel because um, I would say that for most artist run spaces nowadays, there is a seamless transition, you know, like you always have the same artist exhibition here, exhibiting in institutions, exhibiting in commercial galleries, so basically like somehow this distinction is not felt anymore. I'll insert another question in between, namely we're talking about artist run spaces perhaps in the spirit of like non-profit spaces and spaces that struggle, but your case is actually quite particular, namely that you're an artist run company. Um, and I think it's important then to sort of like put that on the table and actually like I mean of course there's this question of power, this question of you know a problem with the collector and so on but like you both to reflux have a completely different kind of like uh, both symbolic but also not just but also actual capital behind you and many years of your practice and so perhaps that can also like f feature is, is part of your position when you're responding to Anna's question. Yes, but I, I think maybe I will also respond to that. I, uh, I don't know exactly how yet, but first I will maybe respond to what Anna was saying, uh, or pick up on it, yeah. Basically, because I kind of lived for the transition very right? because when I went to school in New York, which was, let's say, mid to late 1980s, this is exactly when alternative and artist run spaces suddenly got this idea that they're not alternative in the sense of other, or a completely parallel, different system for circulation of art or circulation of a different kind of art, but they're basically there to facilitate careers of young artists, yeah, and to be a kind of a stepping stone, a transition from being an unknown young artist or somebody who has just finished an art academy towards and facilitate their entrance into the commercial gallery world and meet the collector. So I remember very, very clearly exactly the point where White Columns, the super hippie, whatever, 70s alternative space, suddenly professionalized, yeah? Where they started reviewing uh, artist portfolios, where they started doing solo shows, where they started cure sort of very, very actively courting New York collectors and positioning themselves as a place where a collector may encounter work of a young artist that could be purchased without a dealer, yeah, much cheaper, yeah, which then could become perhaps valuable and stuff like that. And it's really quite interesting and I know exactly the... And then all of the other New York sort of alternative or artist run institution suddenly latched onto that model because it was getting a lot of press coverage, because Art Forum loved it, you know? They were getting New York Times review. There was money, it was sexy, it was interesting. You know, all of the idealism of the 70s was out of the window. 80s were much more cynical, yeah? Uh, 
And it's really kind of fascinating. So this is why for me it's a little bit tricky to talk about alternative or artist crown because I literally, I don't know within, you know, let's say the American continent or North American continent, too many places which are, the, which kept the ethos with, with, at, on which they were founded, yeah? I, I'm from Mexico City and I was involved uh, for a number of years with a space that was called uh, La Panaderia, which is uh, at, uh, the bakery and that's because it was uh, at a former bakery. Um, I mean, like, I, to be absolutely honest, I don't know if it never became commercial because, like, simply because there was no one to uh, buy anything that was done there. But at least for the for the number of years that we operated, it was quite uh, um, it was quite wide. And then, of course, that uh, that very same space it is uh, um, partly to blame for the boom on commercial Mexican art, which we experience now. No, but I mean, it, it did exist. No? I mean, Mexico is North America. No, what I wanted to add is I think that it's, it's once again what interests me in the question is like the ambiguity, the ambiguity of the word independency because I have a feeling that in Europe pretty much and in Italy as well, independent spaces are happy when they're able to generate, you know, um, to give visibility to artists when they're able to be presented by museums, consult and institutions. So there is pretty much this curatorial sort of uh, um, kind of happiness when you're able to anticipate the trends and the names that are then able to, you know, to do a step forward and move to the proper institution. So uh, obviously that, uh, that, that, um, that, that problematizes pretty much the understanding of independence because I think you can't claim for independence and independence is just you know, the desire to anticipate trends and names and be able to kind of feeding, feeding like, uh, exactly, like being a sort of, uh, exactly, like a sort of project room for, you know, other institutions to come and take over what you've been presenting. Uh, for the first time or something like that. Yes, what we're saying then is that uh, European artist space, uh, independent artist spaces should be called futurologists or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> futurologists, yeah, they're pretty much like the world. Um, I mean, and I'm just, just to talk a little bit about what Sarah was saying, right? This, uh, it's something very funny that um, uh, every now and then, and often actually, people uh, immediately say, well, but uh, aren't you a capitalist? You do influx, you make money. And it's as, as if it actually was something to, um, like, essentially bad. And no, 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 but uh, I'm not talking about you. Like, it, it, it often comes as, as if anything that we do was actually um, insincere or uh, just because there is, uh, because we have managed to create a situation that allows us to fund our projects with, without having to resource um, to uh, any funding body. I mean, I think part of that is because um, there are people that are fantastic at writing grants and applying for money. I, I can't for the life of me, neither can Anton. We tried a couple of, uh, I think once we tried to turn Eflux into um, um, a non-for-profit and we, we sat with the, you know, like with the kind of application and set of requirements and letters and this land, very formal bureaucratic language that you have to, to fulfill and they, they ask you whether you're, the, what kind of new ideas do you want to implement within the next five years and I mean like, and, and a kind of like a very, uh, like a format and a, and a set of regulations that I don't think that are very ca uh, counterintuitive to what an independent artist space should be. So at the end, it's uh, like for the freedom of it, it actually seemed much simpler and much more honest to continue funding our own. Um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give that to, I'm gonna leave that to Anton. Okay, um, before I, um, of course I'm uh, saying all this assuming that, what, that all of you know what Eflux is, so I'm going to pass the, the microphone to Anton to explain that. Well, Eflux is something that I started in uh, 1999, where uh, at the time I was collaborating with a couple of friends who were unemployed curators. And I was a kind of an unemployed artist at the time, in the sense that I was not working in a gallery, I did not have too many exhibitions. So all three of us had a lot of time, and we were trying to imagine or reimagine New York City as a, as a site, as a space for production and presentation of art without the kind of 
boundaries and limitations that institutions like museums and whatever more official spaces kind of impose. And so we were doing all sorts of projects in parking lots and city parks and the forest outside of the city. And one of them was a a kind of an overnight show in a Holiday Inn Hotel in Chinatown. And we didn't have any money, so the only way we could disseminate information about it was by email. And something incredibly unexpected happened where we invited 30 people, but something like five or 600 people showed up in the middle of the night. So it was kind of intimidating because we thought the hotel will throw us out, yeah? Because it's very strange if 500 people try to come to your hotel room. So we lied. We told them a story. We told them that we're actually auditioning for a film and the film is being directed by a very eccentric Japanese director who is only for New in New York for one night and the film will be about the art world so everybody who comes will be dressed in black and it completely worked, yeah, they didn't bother us all night, we could do whatever we wanted but in the morning they knocked on the door the hotel people but not to close us down, only because they wanted to be auditioned to be in this film, yeah? So, you know, our lie kind of worked but the next day I thought, wow, this is really quite incredible how this worked and maybe this could be developed into a useful platform for other artists, other curators, other galleries, anybody who did not have the kind of advertising budget, you know, to spend four thousand dollars on a print ad in a magazine or something like that. And then it just kind of snowballed. I mean there was no planning, no no strategy, no no nothing, no investment. Uh, it just kind of happened by itself. But I want to so this is the origin of Iflux, complete accident, yeah. But I wanted maybe to just take one second to add something to what Julieta was saying, yeah? Uh, sorry, I just wanted to explain this to be clear because I think otherwise nobody understands what uh, we are discussing here. Eflux charges institutions and galleries for announcements and uses the uh, procedure, uh, the proceeding uh, uh, funds, uh, to pay for its own projects. That can be either art shows or Eflux journal or um, Time by uh, Sarah has to leave in five minutes, and we we'll, because I wanted to ask you about the specific situation in Cairo, and so if you could you just use these five minutes to uh, go a little bit further into your project. So in very brief, the we started the space. Um, we founded the space on May first. Um, after careful consideration of two years, in the last two years, thinking, well, what does one actually do? Does one start an institution at a time that is politically unstable, that is, you know, like more precarious than usual, um, and what is the role of art at this particular time of like political insurgence? And ultimately, like it, it also just happened by coincidence that there was the space that became available, um, a really beautiful house um, that is in front of my apartment, um, which was quite rare, and it's on a, it's part of a development block from the 40s um, that turned agricultural land into um, residential housing. The area is its own story, but um, we thought, well, perhaps it would be interesting at this particular time to start a space that is, um, like, first and foremost, dedicated to working with artists, um, and not so much focusing or like not trying to like represent a political discourse, rather to actually um, involve artists in all the different steps of uh, founding an institution. So every aspect of the institution is an artist project also. So the registration, the fundraising, the, I mean, the, the way that it was, uh, it was started was very much not planned. Um, the model, it, it, it did, uh, it does give us uh, um, uh, economic uh, safety to be able to do projects, but it's, uh, I mean, I think that it, it's all, um, I mean, it, so it involves, of course, distributing information on behalf of uh, museums and institutions that are related, but also knowing Anton and having worked with him for 10 years, I think that um, um, the, this, this notion of autonomy and independence is so important for the two of us that it, it would not necessarily have to be an art-related model, right? I think we could just as well have an organic farm. There is also a very complex bargain made that artists, like, in order to have a critical position on society, they have to dissociate themselves from business, from commerce, from every involvement in kind of this aspect of everyday life in order 
to be this outsider capable of articulating a critical position. Yeah. So all of the kind of business side of their lives, because they still have to eat, they still have to rent places, they still lived in a capitalist society. Yeah. Needed to be delegated to dealers, whatever agents. Yeah. And this is basically it's a kind of a strange situation where on one hand they gained a certain kind of criticality or capacity for a certain kind of criticality. But on the other hand, they became completely dependent on a system that leads to Mondrian dying in poverty and Rochenko dying in poverty in, you know, in the USSR in 1959. So this is something like, for us, we need to look at this again now, in our time, a little bit more carefully, because you know, I don't think one can one automatically gains criticality through not being involved in this aspects of life. And I think it's certainly okay to be involved. Uh, wouldn't you say that this part of like, you know, like exactly this, that how an artist needs to dissociate himself from any kind of like participation in a capitalist structure in order to criticize this capitalist structure, isn't it part of like this myth? And it's also like, you know, a way of like somehow neutering art because it will never really get involved. With what are like the real materialities of art production and art making? Like, something that happens. Sorry, this is dear to me. Something that happens is that then, of course, there's supposed to be this uh, genius in the studio with the paint stained pants uh, making your masterpiece and then letting it loose to the world and and uh, without being involved in its circulation. The, the problem is that when you let your work out and you, you're not involved in how it circulates, it can be resignified. It can be sold. For all you know, it can be sold to a, a racist comic book, right? And I would personally not want my work to be to, to belong to a corrupt institution or to belong to someone uh, that that stands for something that I that I find uh, ethically wrong. So I think that um, being involved, at the very least, in, in how the work circulates, how does it say, I mean, how it signifies, is, uh, is part and parcel of being an artist. Why don't we open it up? We have so many art professionals in the room. I think it's going to be really interesting to have some comments on their side. Definitely. I mean, like, whoever would like to pose a question, please just raise your hand. Okay, no one at the moment, so we can just go on. But uh, please do interject. Posso fare in italiano? Ok. No, solo una cosa, quando um, Anton parlava di eh, ideologia, no? che eh, durante la nascita dei primi artist of art spaces eh, guidava in qualche modo eh, le attività, eh, mi sembra che una, una, qualcosa su cui si possa ragionare sia invece una posizione etica eh, che può guidare, eh, che può essere eh, un appunto una posizione che in qualche modo ti dà eh, quell'indipendenza, non so, un'indipendenza eh, che ha a che fare più con l'etica che non con l'ideologia, un'etica che qui chiaramente si porta dietro eh, molti altri, altri aspetti ovviamente. No? E, questo lo dico beh, personalmente per quanto mi concerne. Sì. Eh, vabbè, io faccio parte di un, di un gruppo di artisti eh, torinesi che si chiama Diogene e lavoriamo da alcuni anni su diverse attività, eh, sia di, di residenza che di confronto e di progetti che portano, che portano al centro il, eh, il contenuto del lavoro artistico, questo è un po' l'idea, il confronto sui, sui contenuti. Eh, però quello che a me spinge personalmente a, a, a perseguire diciamo, questa via è proprio il fatto di poter in questa dimensione eh, tenere un'etica eh, un del lavoro che mi, in qualche modo mi appartiene e, e, eh, e in quello mi sento eh, anche se vuoi di non fare dei compromessi su alcune, su alcune questioni che ritengo eh, fondanti eh, anche oltre la la pra, oltre alla pratica artistica anche la pratica diciamo, l'essere cittadino e, e un persona che vive in, in un contesto sociale no? quindi in qualche modo posso dire questo per quanto mi riguarda. Uh, that we are quite friendly with, it's called uh, Wage. 
which stands, uh, it's an acronym for Working Artists for the Greater Economy. And I think the, the I mean, I think it's not an artist-run space, it's an artist group. Um, but uh, I mean, I think they started a function just like out of being like entirely exhausted of the fact that as an artist, the people assume that you get paid in glory. So you get paid by having the opportunity to exceed. And that should be enough payment. Meanwhile, um, the curators and the staff on the institution that you are presenting your work, they are all getting salaries and often health insurance and, and um, I don't know, paid lunches when, whenever. No? So that kind of, uh, I mean, like this comes from what Anton was saying as well, right? That the moment that, that you're supposed to not be involved, it's assumed that, I don't know, that you live on thin air. You become completely really disenfranchised from, from a set of very banal but very real uh, needs. So, the, yeah, the idea, I mean, like, paying, uh, I mean, like, this is not like a, even an ethical thing, it's just common sense. I mean, like, sometimes what happens is that artists end up being like an Amazonian forest, right? That, um, you know, like a, a, a corporation goes to the Amazonian forest, cuts the trees, makes fantastic furniture, and uh, uh, the natives are supposed to just be happy that there is some progress coming towards them without any kind of tangible gains. How do you consider this question of ethics when it comes to to to, to, to I mean, Do you consider um, yourself like different from institutions because you also like uh, set up on certain ethical values which uh, you identify with, uh, and you are trying to pursue a longer term, and uh, also when. Uh, when it comes to your collaboration with, with artists and also like organizing exhibitions, also on a practical level, I mean, when it comes to giving fees to artists or stuff like that, I mean, do you have like a certain kind of rules which you try to stick to in order to generate a sort of a set of values that might be interesting also for institutions to, to pursue? Yeah, well, basically, we have a kind of a Scandinavian model. Everybody gets paid. All of the artists get fees, all of the writers that contribute to Flat Journal get very significant fees for essays. Uh, everybody that works at Eflux has health insurance and, and retirement benefits and, you know, the whole bit. Yeah, it's a little bit unusual, I guess, in the art world in New York, but, but for us it's super, super, super important because otherwise our, you know, whatever ethical position or our moral position or the content of our work doesn't make any sense if we don't practice it internally as well, yeah? Just a, a, a quick note, uh, but I mean, like that is, uh, I don't think, uh, I mean, it, yeah. One should remember that we are both artists, and then the, uh, the founding of Reflux, which really started from Anton in his computer um, in his apartment, and then I, shortly after I came in, and it has been drawn very much with the kind of, um, uh, I would say playfulness almost um, of an art project, right? And it's become what it has become, not planned, um, but it's really something that I don't distance from the rest of my practice. It would be uh, uh, schizophrenic if I did. It's uh, very much the same spirit that animates the collaborations, that animates uh, making a project that is bigger than myself, that does not need uh, to be signed by an author, but it's actually a collective endeavor. That's sort of what makes Eflux function. And I'm not so sure that's what makes an institution function. I would not know how to answer that. Volevo ricordarmi a quanto detto dal collega riguardo l'indipendenza dell'artista. Io ritengo che oggi il lavoro dell'artista sia simile a quello di uno scienziato, nel senso che bisogna continuare lì dove altri sono arrivati. Ed è per questo che è necessario, secondo me, uno studio sempre più profondo, perché non è pensabile non tener conto di quello che è stato fatto in altre, da altri artisti e in tutte le parti del mondo, perché se vogliamo operare in un certo modo dobbiamo operare globalmente, non posso fare qualcosa che magari è stato fatto negli Stati Uniti di cui io non sono a conoscenza ed è per questo che io da un po' di tempo ritengo che l'artista debba fare come 
fanno coloro che scrivono dei saggi mettere le note in calce a piedi pagina proprio per indicare quali sono i loro maestri perché molto spesso vediamo delle fiere in tutte le manifestazioni che ci sono cose che vengono ripetute e ripetute trovando poi delle motivazioni anche banali ma tutto ciò viene supportato magari da una grande organizzazione, da una grande galleria, da, eh, dalle istituzioni, quindi io ritengo che l'artista per vederne effettivamente il valore dovrebbe eh, combattere come si faceva nelle arene ad armi pari in un certo senso, ma soprattutto quello che conta, ciò che conta sono le idee che questo artista deve portare avanti, le piccole idee e naturalmente tenere conto delle altre idee, ecco perché occorre eh, mettere le note in calce alla pittura secondo me. Well, I, I would say, you know, like, there's, uh, you, you have to somehow, like, split it into different levels, because, like, one reason why you cannot do the same thing all over again is because, like, uh, the idea of, like, modern art has to do with historical progress, meaning the belief that, uh, you know, like, society is heading in a direction where the future will be better than the past was. You know, like, so if you really understand uh, this claim, or, like, this enlightenment claim, hmm? Well, <laughs> that wasn't around back then. But uh, if you really take seriously this claim, then uh, of course, then uh, yeah, you also put, uh, have to take serious the claim that you know, like uh, art should be uh, or should be something else than just like a mere formal repetition or a mere formal mannerism. But then there's like another layer uh, where you also have to see how. Uh, there's like a constant quest for novelty inside of the market structure because of course like you know like if you do not have like the next batch of products coming freshly into the market at some point the whole system comes to a halt and and that would be like an understanding of art inside like the whole structure of uh, 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 consumerism and of like uh, you know like the consumption of like or consumption goods i guess i wanted to bring the conversation back around to where you guys started when you were talking about how artist run spaces begin 200 years ago, this notion of revolution, of idealism, of like moving something forward. And I mean, from my experience, but also from listening to you guys today, it seems that the contradiction is the notion of sustainability. Like why should these spaces last? Like why should we try to make these things last over time if their role in a way is part of a bigger organism? I mean, is this, I mean, You know, I'm, I'm living in a community of artists from spaces where they pop up, they disappear, and it's more about the bigger picture. So, I agree to you, Sabah. And in this, uh, uh, we may not agree, so that's uh, uh, entirely possible. Um, my, my, I mean, the way I see it is that things uh, function and should exist for as long as they are necessary. So, um, you know, when something, otherwise they become ossified, they become just something um, living from Mexico, that is a party that has been in power for uh, almost a century, that is called the PRI, which stands in Spanish for the party of the institutionalized revolution. You cannot institutionalize a revolution. So, you don't want to make an artist run space that becomes an institutionalized revolution. You, you know, it keeps going. It needs to exist for six months, for two years, for five, for ten, as long as there is something um, occupying that space. It does not need to be the same people. It doesn't have to be the same face. I mean, like, that, that space needs to be occupied is true. Um, no, I think speaking about, about reproducing it's a uh, It's very interesting. I, think, I hope you know, we have more and more independent spaces coming out from this film in the next year because it's really one of the last uh, uh, trends in the country. I mean, I don't even know if it's correct, but it's trend. I mean, it's something which came out from, 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 from an urgency of the artists, so which, is really, which is really great because of it, most of the institutions we have in the country are now in the midst of a very complicated financial situation. And so we, you, you can't see any proper idea coming out from institution in this country. I mean, a vision for the future or something like that. So, I mean, if you want to come across with interesting things, you definitely have to have a look at what the artists themselves are trying to do on a, let's call it, institutional level or whatever you want. But, I mean, it's something which has not been imposed by them from, you know, major institutions and they're really trying to um, develop vision for the future and trying to engage themselves in, uh, 
in, in a way out also from, from uh, the financial crisis. So I think, um, I don't know, I, I think speaking about Italy, it's, uh, it's really where you have to look at now. So, and I think it's, uh, it's going to continue in, uh, like that for the future. Obviously, as I uh, was trying to say in the beginning, uh, there's a lot of you know, problems and issues and ambiguities related to the funding of this, uh, of this institution because there's a lack of also support coming from the private sector, you know. And, um, but, um, but I mean, it's incredible to, 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 to be able to experience like, the growth of, uh, of uh, proposals and ideas coming from an independent space uh, in Italy. So let, let, let's see what happens. I think it's, uh, um, I think, uh, you know, the very future of the art scene in Italy is going to be defined by, by the role that independent and artist fund spaces are, will be able to, to, to implement. Uh, I, I just wanted to maybe respond to you very briefly that, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right, but also, you know, sometimes I think that we actually need a lot, a lot more time, yeah? Because like this context, like commercial art world, art fairs, gallery exhibitions, everything is built in very short cycles, you know, one season, two seasons. A friend of mine who is an artist, Walid Rad, did a research recently that apparently the average career of an artist in the market lasts four years. After that, they're completely consumed, spent, they have no future, yeah? But we know as artists that it takes a decade to develop ideas or develop some kind of practice that has any meaning sometimes, you know? So what kind of, you know, like temporality is really tricky, you know, because I think maybe we need both. We need this very kind of things that, that appear and disappear, that are very fluid, that, that yeah, but we also need places and, and organizations and contexts that, that are here for much more long-term projects, you know, that are not here towards an exhibition next season or two years from now, but, you know, and it's, it's quite important. I would just like to underline what Anton is saying. I think that we too easily forget, especially now that, you know, like the whole uh, um, European state is crumbling or the idea of the nation state in Europe is crumbling. We all forget that uh, uh, what we have now as institutions were actually, you know, like uh, uh, at the beginning this very claim to the political, which is a democratic claim, so the claim of representation. And now when all these institutions are being, or the funding is being eroded and uh, the whole system is just like being left out to dry, uh, I mean the question would be what, what comes after and uh, uh, as Anton was uh, mentioning uh, yesterday, if the, f the future is private and everything is in the ends of like private corporations, private spaces, sponsors, private patrons, uh, what is left for, you know, like what will art become? Not, not merely in terms of like what exhibition opportunities artists will have, but really what will become the content of art and hmm? portraits. Yeah, because I mean that this is not. It is actually not a joke because if you if you think that uh, you know the radical content of modern art was precisely to break with this like still celebratory structures of the ancien regime, you know like if you have like a reversal in structures of representation, what will become the content of art is quite like uh, you know it breaks the question. Uh, I'm, I'm spending some time in Rome now and I'm going to be La Borghese. Uh, maybe really the future of Italy hangs on. The <laughs> But um, it, it was very funny to see, I mean, like, uh, the collection of Villa Borghese is of course fantastic, and then you just like, see its you know, like, mastery, you know, beautiful, beautiful hands. And you just see the, 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 the limitations of content, right? Which is of course um, ecclesiastic uh, representations or patrons. And I was, like, I was like feeling that I was, uh, I saw so many Madonna with chat, and I was like, is this a uh, lactate, like a uh, breastfeed your children? Uh, the uh, uh, campaign or, or what is going on because <laughs> yeah breast is best or what was that so I mean like, and then you see the moment I mean like, because the collection spans um, uh, quite some time you see the moment when there is a break and artists start to be able to address a different kind of content that's coming from them not from an obligation to fulfill the portrait of Lady Margarita the Fort or whatever. I mean, it's um, it's. I would I would really hate to think that art could uh, even remotely head back in that direction. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, Julieta. Thank you, Luigi.